It lends and it controls. It chooses and yet it overburdens an economy. Allegations like these are daily affairs. Reports are plenty. And amidst all this critique, World Bank still lands up being a leading development assistance agency, which lends considerably to South Asia, including Bangladesh. In our studios tonight, we have Mr. Chima Fan, the country director for Bangladesh, uh, Nepal and Bhutan and South Asia, of course, uh, of the World Bank. Welcome to the studios. Delighted to be here. Well, we are doubly delighted because, uh, no, actually we are not. We're kind of sad too because you're leaving pretty soon. That's right. <laughs> and you've been uh, in Bangladesh since 2016. Mm -hmm. So PhD in economics from England, born in China, right. working in and for South Asia, which is the identity that you treasure the most? I think I treasure the identity of the combination of all three. And that is, I think, that's the beauty of working at the World Bank. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter uh, where you're from. And, and I often tell people I have... Uh, one of the best jobs in the world that is you get to help the world and get paid at the same time. That's a lovely lead line actually that I'd like to use and um, throw back at you. So you enjoy helping the world and you get paid too. What about the endless criticisms that the bank gets in the process? You're heavily criticized for your bias I mean, your citing of infrastructure projects often uh, draw critique. How do you face that? I think it's, it's not surprising. Um, development is a challenging business, um, and that applies to the business we're in as well. Um, and as you say, we are the largest developed financial institution globally. Um, and we also have um, the highest standards, I think. Ultimately, the project we finance are projects of the countries. So it's just, I think it's very important to recognize that these are not World Bank projects. These are projects proposed, prepared, uh, and proposed by the countries. The World Bank is a financier. Obviously, as any financier, that we have certain standards, particularly on safeguards regarding the environment and regarding the, the social safeguards. Uh, as well as on the fiduciary side, we need to make sure that the money we provide do go to the intended purposes. They're used properly so that the money we provide to the country actually produce results for the people of the country we support. Thank you for an elaborate answer. You're, you're quite a diplomat handling all the questions and juggling all the answers. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I was just uh, wondering about during your tenure in, in Bhutan uh, and Nepal and Bangladesh, uh, which was the most challenging country? I think each and every country is unique. Um, and um, these three countries, I think they all have unique challenges. Bangladesh, of course, it's a very populous country. I often tell people, they say, what do you think of Bangladesh? I say, when you think of Bangladesh, you need to think about you know, putting about half of the U.S. population into the state of Louisiana. That of itself is an enormous challenge. How do you feed everybody with so many people and with so little land? So that's Bangladesh. And for Nepal, it's a landlocked, mountainous country. It's a place where connectivity is a real challenge. But it's a, it's a medium-sized country. And the country also depends enormously on remittances. So how do you actually develop an economy that is landlocked has huge challenges with connectivity. At the same time, it's also a country that has huge 
hydropower potential, for example. And in the case of Bhutan, it's a small, landlocked, mountainous country. In some ways, uh, the challenges are even more than in Nepal, because it's much, much smaller. Again, it is a country with enormous um, hydropower potential as well as both countries have tourism potential. I think there, of course, what we have in Bhutan is an economy that at this moment it's very much dependent on hydropower exports uh, and on tourism. So the challenge there going forward is really how can we help the country to develop a more diversified economy that's driven by the private sector. And the country faces at this very moment the real challenges of creating jobs for the young, particularly the young people in the urban area. And in the case of Nepal, I said, really, how do we get investment, particularly private investment, up, both domestic and private investment, up uh, to support the country in a historic transition towards federalism? That's decentralization. It is actually quite remarkable that we have seen in the last year and a half that a country has been able to conduct very successfully and peacefully three levels of elections with new governments created from scratch at the provincial as well as the local level. So the challenge there is that how do we actually help the country to deliver services to the people in this new federal structure where well, capacity is relatively weak. Thank you. I, th I think we have our answer in your response, which is Bangladesh is the most populous and we are your obvious favorites. I kind of, uh, <laughs> I think that that's an obvious from your response. But uh, so would you agree with me if I asked you that um, Bangladesh is indeed a development surprise? I think it, Bangladesh has always been a development surprise, and it's what Bangladesh has been able to achieve is actually quite remarkable, uh, particularly in the last two decades. If you look at extreme poverty, it has been halved in the 25-year period between uh, 1995 uh, and, um, and now. Um, and if you look at the human development indicators, where it's primary enrollment or the health indicators, Bangladesh has made tremendous progress. And Bangladesh made those progress against the backdrop of uh, one, uh, the most densely populated country I mentioned. And two, Bangladesh is also at the same time a country that is most vulnerable to climate change. And three, and that's what we're seeing today, is that in the context of rapid urbanization. All of these, obviously, together creates an extremely challenging environment for the country's development. And yet, in that challenging environment, the country has been able to make tremendous progress. Would you also agree with me if I said that World Bank often <coughs> underestimates uh, the power of governments, of national governments? I don't think we underestimate the power of national governments. You in fact, I think the bank's approach to development has always been, and will continue to be, relying on the countries themselves. Our role, um, it's actually a, to support governments and other stakeholders in the country uh, to drive their own development. We do that through, of course, obviously financing concessionary finance in the case of Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal. Uh, but at the same time, we try to bring in our analytical work, that is to help countries to identify some of the key challenges and bring evidence to the policy-making process, which I think it's probably um, equally important, if not more important, than the financing uh, itself. Um, in that sense, and that's where the World Bank's uh, strength is, is that we combine financing with advice. That advice, it's evidence-based, but it's also bringing the experiences we have from across the world. So, Chima, how much does World Bank actually lend to Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, and Nepal? 
Yeah, we have um, the current <coughs> active portfolio uh, in Bangladesh is um, $12.6 billion. That's um, a, um, a doubling from five years ago. Last year, the, we committed uh, $3 billion new money mm -hmm. to Bangladesh, and that's a record. Mm -hmm. um, so far this year, we've done about another $1.7 billion. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, it's um, obviously it's important to look at um, how much have we done vis-a-vis -vis a few years ago. Uh, and obviously Bangladesh remains uh, the largest, in fact, uh, recipient of uh, International Development right, Association's yes. financing. What about Nepal and Bhutan? What are the well, sizes Nepal like? Nepal has also had a uh, significant increase. Um, again, when last year in Nepal, we did uh, 700 million. Again, it's a historic record. Um, the current portfolio in Nepal, it's about uh, uh, $2.6 billion, uh, which is quite significant for a country of about 29 million. In Bhutan, um, our financing uh, for this, what's called Ida 18 period, that's a three-year period from fiscal year 18 to 20, our financing for Bhutan um, has been doubled uh, from about 50 million three years ago to 100 million in that three-year period, mm -hmm. obviously given the rel relatively small size uh, of, of the population in the country. This is a very significant amount. Well, with that, uh, it's time for a short break and we should be back in the studios in no time. Here we are back again, Chima. Um, would you again agree with me if I asked you that World Bank imposes serious and severe conditionalities to the loans uh, that they provide. How tough are you and could you be more flexible? I don't think we impose uh, conditions. I think it's very important to understand the way the World Bank works. First, this is an organization that's owned by over 180 um, countries. So Bangladesh is one of the shareholders of the World Bank Group. So it is the shareholders themselves together decide on the kind of policies that the World Bank has to follow. Second, I think as a financier for development, we all wanted to make sure that the financing we provide um, complies with the best environmental and social safeguards. I don't think anybody would want to see World Bank financing projects that are environmentally or socially unsustainable. Nobody wants to see that, and therefore it is very, very important for World Bank financing to be fully compliant with those safeguards policies. The same with fiduciary. I think all of us wanted to see that World Bank financing, every dollar of it, and every sense of it goes to its intended purposes, and that is the development of the country. So I think it's if one is referring to these standards and fiduciary requirements, yes, we do have very high standards in terms of fiduciary requirements, in terms of social and environmental safeguards, which I think the recipients, and that's the countries, who are getting these financing from the World Bank would want it them to be. Well, Chimao, you just led me on to the biggest traps <coughs> that you've laid for yourself. I'm going to straight away ask you about the Narmada uh, River Valley controversy and also about the <coughs> Nepal's distribution line. Um, I, I really want your views on that because you said that you pick and choose according to stricter standards whereby uh, everyone benefits. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to know from you what, are, what is your stance on all the controversies that you faced in India and Nepal both? I think obviously um, the World Bank finances uh, thousands of projects around the world. Um, it is ultimately, it's a responsibility of the recipients of that financing who are the owners of those projects to make sure 
that they implement the social and environmental safeguards and the fiduciary uh, responsibilities that come with that financing. So it is, I think it's very, very important to be clear that these are not World Bank projects. These are World Bank finance projects that are owned and implemented by governments who get that financing from, that, from the World Bank. I think in whenever that countries in their implementation of World Bank finance projects are not fully implementing the environmental and social safeguards or the fiduciary policies that are required of that financing, uh, then obviously we need to take remedial actions. Um, and that, I think, we take it extremely seriously. We do want it to make sure that every project we finance uh, do uh, produce the kind of development results that we want it to. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, so United States has 15%, right, voting rights? It's just under 16%, just yes. Just under 16 And obviously, they're the biggest influencer in, uh, in World Bank assistance. Um, and do you think that decides uh, your course of action most of the time? It does, right? Now, obviously, I think uh, all our shareholders collectively decide on the World Bank's policies. They approve policies proposed by management. But in terms of operations, that's a responsibility of World Bank management, and that's run by a professional staff uh, in many ways I think the World Bank is actually probably one of the most decentralized organizations in terms of its decision-making process. In the case of Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal, for example, most of the decisions on the projects and the lending operations are decided by me as the country director, of course, together with my management teams, proposed by our teams. So we do have a rigorous process of, of course, appraising projects and reviewing. And for high-risk projects, uh, these decisions go to a regional-wide operational committee or for very high-profile, high-risk operations that go to the bank-wide operations committee for approval. So this, in that sense, I think um, we have actually a very decentralized structure of decision-making supported by a corporate and regional mechanism that making sure that, that we can also bring in the perspectives uh, of our colleagues across the world and across the region to help us to make the best decisions. Chima, at this point, I must thank you <clears throat> for World Bank's assistance uh, in bringing all the South Asian people across in one platform, which you call the South Asian Champions Round, where we often see the track four and track three diplomacy kind of makes it. Um, I think one of the projects that World Bank really can take pride in mm. is probably the energy success across mm. Bangladesh and India. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the part World Bank, outside the bank even, engaged and brought uh, uh, people from various uh, sectors and put them all together and, and made the magic happen. Mm. Would you consider Bangladesh, India, um, across the border power, sync as one of your critical success points? I'm actually very delighted to see the progress that's been made uh, in power trade between India and Bangladesh and in fact also between um, Nepal and India as well as between Bhutan and India. Um, you're absolutely right. I think energy is absolutely critical. And energy is a, it's a sector, particularly in electricity. It's an area where we can find win-win solutions across the region, where countries like India and Bangladesh, which require huge amount of energy supplies, don't necessarily have all the supplies themselves. And they can benefit from the supplies from both Bhutan and Nepal. So what I would like to see going forward is to build on that success we have had so far uh, bilaterally between Bangladesh, India, between Nepal, India, and between Bhutan and India to see 
terms of multi-party power trade. It would be great to see, for example, that Bangladesh investing in hydropower in both Bhutan and, and Nepal, Nepal, and for both Bhutan and Nepal uh, to export in addition to India to Bangladesh as well. That, I think, is the kind of thing uh, we would very much like to see, and as you know very well, this is an area where the World Bank has uh, put a lot of effort in supporting. It is an area that has huge potential for the people of this sub-region. How do you think South Asia could be better? Things can actually happen here in Bangladesh. I think despite the many challenges and despite on the surface the messiness and the chaos, for example in Dhaka traffic, um, that development actually happen in Bangladesh. People's lives do get improved very significantly. We do see poverty get reduced quite dramatically and we see more children going to school and now going to better schools and we do see the country tackling some of the most difficult uh, climate change issues and we do see the country moving forward. I often say that um, you know, if that the private sector can work in a challenging environment like Bangladesh today. Just imagine what they can do if the environment is improved. They can do wonders. This is a country that can grow above 8 or even 10 percent for many years if we have the right kind of policies in place. Chima, you're going back to Washington. What are you going to miss about South Asia, um, what is your heart going to long for when you're back in Washington? I think for me it's the, what I enjoy most and I think I will miss most is obviously the daily interactions I have with the client and that's the government officials, people like you, the private sector and all the other stakeholders in these great countries. Well, on that note, Chimao, I'm just hoping that you'll come back to South Asia one more time and uh, watch us flourish and grow, nurture us, and uh, from a distance at least, and we hope that you'll continue being a friend of South Asia. Absolutely. Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and South Asia in general will be always in my heart. Thank you very much, Chimao, for being here with us today. Safe journey, safe travels, and good luck. Thank you. So there's a debate on whether the World Bank leaves countries in perpetual debt. There is also controversy about their lending policies. But nevertheless, World Bank still continues being the most impressive development assistance agency, dispensing billions of dollars to the third world. And on that note, on that positive note rather, we end here tonight wishing all the South Asians the best of all that could be. Thanks for watching us. नोटुन नोटुन वीडियो पे ते नागोरी के YouTube चैनल टी सब्सक्राइब करों एवं पाशे था का बेल आइकॉन टी चाप्पू